Welcome everyone to the version 8 marketing podcast. This is the podcast for those interested in learning about modern marketing strategies that can help you attract more customers. Right, so today in our office, we have Kyle Farrar. How's it, Kyle? Farrah. Farrah. <laughs> Farrah, there you go. This is the second interview that we have and the second time I'm, I'm announcing the in <laughs> the person's <laughs> name incorrectly. Perfect. That's embarrassing, but it's cool. <laughs> Look, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for having me on board. And uh, yeah, congrats to what you guys are doing. I think you guys are doing some awesome stuff. It's a pleasure to be on the podcast. Thank you, man. So um, I appreciate that. It, it really means a lot. So from our side, the reason I wanted to bring Kyle on board, and he looks like a very young, you know, he is a very young entrepreneur, actually. And I think the biggest reason you're here today is because, dude, we met, what is it, like six, seven months ago, eight months ago? Yeah, it was the end of last year sometime. Towards the end of last year, yeah. And uh, you hit me up on LinkedIn, and uh, you talked about social media ads, funnels, and driving traffic and sales and leads, and that's the kind of stuff that gets me all excited. <laughs> so it was like, it was like uh, I was wondering, is this, a, is this my type of catfish? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm pitching to an agency owner. <laughs> yeah, nonetheless, it's all good. I think from my side, I, this, you know, that's the kind of stuff that gets me excited. And I was like, I don't know who this guy is, this kid, I thought at that time. <laughs> but I'm going to ring him up and find out what his story is. So, I mean, that blossomed into a cool relationship. Yeah. And um, yeah, man, I'm actually honored to have you here on the podcast. Thank so, you very much. And uh, all I can say is I'm very glad that you decided to call me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had coffee and I remember we were there for like two hours in, uh, where was it actually? It was close to Rosebank somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So we had like a coffee for two hours and we just talked about social media and, and you know all kinds of digital marketing stuff, which was really cool. So yeah, man, I think our listeners, they are all small, medium-sized business owners, marketers, and a lot of people are probably looking to start their side hustles. And I think that's the main reason you're here because that's kind of like the, the niche that you, you know, tap into when it comes to your expertise and obviously ourselves as well from a social media marketing perspective. But I think one thing that I you know, appreciate about what you guys are doing is how to get the most amount of impact with the lowest budget. Yeah. You know, people don't always well, think it. pennies. People don't think yeah. about the pennies, right? So from my side, before we talk about all the cool stuff that we want to talk about, maybe you just want to introduce yourself to our listeners a little bit and, and where you started and how you got into, you know, digital marketing. Yeah. So um, I am, my name is Carl Farah. So I'm the founder and head of growth of Future Famous Media. So... First, I'll speak about Future Famous Media. So what we're doing now is we're providing direct response digital marketing solutions to small to medium-sized businesses. And our sort of niche is that we just focus on paid advertising to drive business results. And business results being, you know, increasing somebody's revenue, getting them more leads, and obviously, most importantly, getting them more sales. So I, I decided at 18 after high school not to go to uh, university. I haven't been sure about many, many things in my life, but one thing I knew was that university wasn't for me, and it sounds super cliche because that's what every budding entrepreneur mm. says, right? But I need to add that I was in university for three months before I dropped out. That's good, you see, because a, a lot of people, they say that they, they go to university and they drop out realizing it's not for them. I literally didn't even go to university. Yeah. I was so sure about it that I didn't even take that sort of leap. I was like, nope, not for me. But you, you dropped out quite early, which shows that you, you knew very early. You were self-aware. I think that's a big uh, thing. Yeah, I think I wanted to go play rugby professionally. My parents said you need a plan B, and that's to go and study, obviously. So I got yeah. into Porch of Struum. Uh, Ufer de Fuer uh, was one of the <laughs> yeah, uh, houses I was at. And I quickly realized that it wasn't for me. And eventually, by you know some miracle, uh, the contract to Italy actually came through to go and play professional. So I was like, okay. this is a sign. Yeah, like, it's I'm taking it. Like I'm signing it and I'm leaving. And my dad was like, well, if you ever want to study, then you're going to have to take care of yourself. Yeah. And uh, so I was like, sweet, I'm going to take this risk. Did you know for sure that that, that thing that you were studying was what you wanted to do? Or for you, once the opportunity came, you knew, okay, perfect, study is gone. It's my ticket out of here and now I can go. You know what my opinion is, is that I think... At the age of 16, 17, 18, you don't know yourself well enough to you know don't. what you want to do. No chance. I, I thought I wanted to be in sport for the rest of my life. Today, I couldn't think about anything worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that sounds sad. I mean, there's a lot of people making a good career out of it, obviously. Yeah. So, no, I mean, I, it's just not something I enjoy anymore yeah. because I've changed. Like, 
who I was at 18, who I am today, two completely different people. Absolutely. And that's the thing that you don't really think about in schools. As much as you have to, you choose subjects what, in, when you're 16 or in grade 10, and that's going to affect the rest of your life because you're still thinking about university. But you haven't really gotten your first job yet. You don't know what you like. And you, I think the big thing is self-awareness, right? We don't know ourselves well enough to decide on what we want to study. And yeah. so it, it stems from there. And I think uh, it's Gary Vee that talks about it a lot, about yeah. how you influenced by your parents' decisions. I must be honest, my parents didn't influence me yeah, to make, same, yeah. make that decision. Um, they wanted me to do whatever I f- felt like I was going to enjoy. Yeah. But at that time, I thought I was going to enjoy that. Yeah. So they wanted me to live my passion, and I thought that was my passion. And yeah. up until the age of 22, I fell in love with the internet. So, yeah. And uh, we've been best mates ever since. Yeah. I think that's a very, very good point, because I think it's not bad if parents sort of push younger people to go to university because they want the opportunity that they necessarily didn't have. But at the same time, I think that it's it's so, so important to be to, to be self-aware and also to have sort of understanding parents. And I think that's where I was very fortunate because just to go back a bit, when I was sort of making the decision to not go to university, my dad was very clear. He said, listen, whether you go to university or not, I'm going to support you, but I can see that you have some type of interest in business. And then why don't you consider coming into business with me? So I was super fortunate. I think if my dad had been very, very strict and very hard on me and said, you have to go to university I would have said yes. I mean, I'm young. I don't know any better. Yeah. And I'm also, you know, I'm sponging off them because they're paying for my, my bills and my finances. So I think, th- I think I got very, very fortunate. And that was like the, the springboard to everything else. So I decided when I was sort of 18 to not go to university. It wasn't for me. And I was just weighing up my options. And I was supposed to go to Tux to go play cricket and rugby and decided against it. And then at the time, my dad had just acquired a new Wimpy restaurant that my brother was going to, you know, take over and start running. And then I thought, okay, well, look, if, if I want to learn about business and, and I am actually serious about this, let me prove to my dad that I am and let me go into the restaurants. And I think that was the best sort of business experience ever because the restaurant game is very, very hard. It's very unforgiving. You have to learn very, very hard lessons. And I think that gave me a good sort of idea in terms of the world of entrepreneurship. Like, okay, this is the real world. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? This is the real, real, real world. So to go back to link it to now was I did that for two years. We were fortunate enough to then sell the restaurants. I had a bit of um, profit share that my dad, that I'd worked for, that I was very fortunate that my dad gave me. So this is at a very young age, right? So you had, yeah. you got into business at a very young age. You got profit share that a lot of people probably don't even know what it is at the age of like 22, 23, 24. Um, and yeah, how old are you now? Just for the listeners and watching. So now I'm 25. Just turned 25. Yeah. So you're 25. For so at a very young age, you were influenced, obviously, with business and yeah. how it works and how it operates. That's very cool, man. Yeah, thank you. I think and it, the, the, the important thing was, obviously, you know, I had to work for that profit share and prove myself that I was, you know, worthy of getting it. But it's when you're in a family business, it's very, very different because mm. it's not like you're proving yourself to a boss. It's like it's your, it's your dad. So it's even more serious than having a boss. So I was very, I'll say I'm very, very lucky. And I, you know, I learned a lot of good entrepreneurial skills from my dad because he's the, he's the purest form of, of entrepreneur I've ever seen. Like the smartest on the, on the go type guy. It's just, when you think of entrepreneur, you know, my dad is that yeah. person. So I was very, very fortunate to work with somebody like that. And I think that was the, the mentor I got early on. And then we were lucky enough to sell the business. I made a small amount of money. And then from there, I decided, okay, I want to travel now. And that for me was, was very, very good. So I decided to go into the superyard industry and get a job, you know, for the listeners, the super yacht industry is basically where you clean yachts for a living and you travel the world. It's not that super as you uh, think it is. Yeah, they painted the dream really, really well, but you pretty much just go there and you labor. You know, you travel, you travel the world, that's great. You earn really good money, but you wash yachts. So very, very early on, I realized that, listen, this I can't do for the rest of my life. Like, I need to start planning my escape. So then I started going into the whole world of same as you did. I uh, started discovered, discovering the internet. And that came about from a Ty Lopez and a Gary Vaynerchuk video on YouTube. And then as a, I th- yeah. I think we need to add that for, I'm sure everybody knows Gary Vee, but if you don't know Ty Lopez, go Google him so that you can understand what yeah. Carl had to see for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> and what he was introduced to for the first time. For sure, yeah. So Ty Lopez was an interesting one to watch and Gary Vee was also. And then I think as a lot of people do when they get into the digital marketing world or the online money world or something like that, they go down the YouTube rabbit hole and they just start watching video after mm. video after video. So when I was on the yachts, I went down the, the YouTube rabbit hole discovering like, I always thought entrepreneurship was, you know, like in the real world, like brick and mortar businesses or restaurants. I didn't realize that there was this other... Big buildings, big yeah, offices, yeah. suits, ties, for PAs sure. and secretaries. <laughs> for sure. And now, and now I realized that there's a whole online entrepreneurship world that I'd never discovered before. So at the time I was earning good enough money on the yachts that I could pay for all these online courses and start experimenting with digital marketing. And to cut a very long story short, um, 
after my second yacht, it was about a year and a half into my super yacht journey, I realized that all these guys were saying how underpriced social media was. They were saying that you need to do social media ads, you need to do Facebook ads, you need to do Google ads, et cetera, et cetera. And the thing that they were all doing was they were selling their expertise. So for me at that stage, I thought, well, you know, I don't have any expertise. I mean, I'm 23 years old. I've worked at a Wimpy and I know how to clean a super yacht. I'm like, what, what, what expertise could I possibly sell? So I had a good think of it, and then I had sort of a light bulb moment. I thought, okay, well, using everything that I've learned from these gurus and these experts, let me try and sell something I know. And the only thing I knew was how to clean yachts and how to get a job yeah. in a super yacht. And at that time, you probably think, nobody cares about that. <laughs> nobody cares. But then I realized on that point, actually, interesting enough, I noticed that a lot of the young South Africans that were coming into the super yacht industry weren't getting good information. Yeah. They were paying for courses they didn't need. They were getting ripped off. They were... They were just getting a lot of really bad inform information. So I thought, okay, well, I didn't want to brand it as myself. So I created a quick Facebook page called Super Yacht School, wrote a 95 page ebook, and then I thought, if I can sell this, there's something to this digital marketing did you, story. Did you quickly write a 95 page ebook? <laughs> <laughs> just explain that quickly. <laughs> copy, paste, copy, paste. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. quickly, yeah, quickly. <laughs> it's, it's four months quickly. Hey, it worked. Yeah, so fortunately, using everything I learned, um, I won't get into too much detail with like lookalike audiences or everything like that, but sold, sold quite a lot of the ebooks, which I was fortunate. And then for me, that was my light bulb moment. That was me escaping the super yachts. And I was selling a, a guide on how to get a job on a super yacht. It was a $9 guide, and I was selling it for $3. So for me, in my mind, if I spent $1, I got $3 out. Yeah. And I thought, wow, this is actually incredible. These gurus are right. And it's technically the only cost that you really have attached because it's a digital product, right? Selling thin air. That's Selling. the problem we have with a lot of you know, our clients. It's difficult to get the same ROI if you have tangible goods, mm. warehouse space, rent, staff. Exactly. But if you have something that's, you know, that's digital, it, it, it allows you to run a lot more profitable campaigns. It also allows you to scale quicker, but Absolutely. we'll talk about that. Yeah, later. and I think the, yeah, the automation factor and just the point of selling something that you don't have to physically be involved in the service delivery of it, so I think on your point, that's exactly true. And that for me was like crazy. I'm like, There's, I've spent this much and this is what I got back. And I thought, you know, rem remembering my time in the, in the Wimpy and with my dad, how like with restaurants especially, margins are tiny. Margins are so small. You've got to watch your costs. And I thought, well, this could so potentially be something that business owners would be interested in. And for me at that stage, I was so sick and tired of cleaning yachts. I just wanted to get out of there. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. So then came back to South Africa and, you know, researched it a lot, tried to put a business model to it. And that in a nutshell, was the birth of Future Famous Media. That's so cool, man. And how long did you... So you won the yachts for two years. Yeah. And you ran this side hustle business of yours. How long did you run that for? For three months. Because okay. what I did was I, I thought I was smart and I wanted to turn it into an online course, which I did, and I sold a couple of those. But then what I realized was a lot of the times when you create an online course, maybe for your viewers, you know, there has to be a community that you're building. Mm -hmm. And I realized that for me to create a community, I have to answer people's questions and always be available. And I was just building community around something I wasn't passionate about. So okay. I almost felt like a, not a fraud, but I felt almost bad to make people pay for a course and I'm not there for you're them like, type of thing. Yeah, you're just not so, passionate about it the way that you should be when you're asking someone to kind of like pay for what you exactly. have to say, right? Nail on the head. So future famous media, man. So that started... 2018. Okay. Sorry, no, 2000 and 2019. My apologies. Yeah, January 2019. So that's last year. So you yeah. guys, congrats for making it through the first year, man. Yeah, thank you. And thank you guys you. have had some nice growth as well. Touch wood, yeah. <laughs> cool. So tell us a little bit more about the venture and then where you guys are. And I know specifically that you, you mentioned you hired your first employee, which was a big step. So congrats on that. Thank you very much. And I think, um, you know, the specialty behind, because there's the digital marketing industry is so broad, right? Yeah. I mean, it's massive. You We partner a lot of times with agencies, even though the client wants digital marketing, like we, like you, specialize in the paid space. Yeah. So that's what we specialize in, but it doesn't mean we're a holistic digital marketing agency. Yeah. You guys have obviously found your niche, and that's paid media. And what side of paid media is that at the moment? So we literally just focus on paid media to drive business results, as we said. So we're playing a very tricky sort of game because I think when you are marketing you know, creativity, 
creatively or it's a bit more subjective. You know, you won't really necessarily attach a business result to it. You might have more arbitrary results like, you know, we launched this creative and it got a thousand views or got a thousand likes. Whereas with yeah. us, the paid media that we're doing is we saying to business owner, this is what you're going to pay and we are trying our best to drive this business result. So the paid media that we do is funnel building to drive a business result. So to get a return on ad spend all the time. Yeah. So it's basically social media and obviously some Google and search engine. Oh yeah, stuff. sorry, yeah. So Facebook, so, Google, So YouTube. social media and search engine and then obviously the funnel building which we'll talk about now because yeah. a lot of people think essentially it's just running social media ads and the sales will come but that's only the start of it right yeah. there's so much that needs to happen in the back end when it comes to trying to get a customer to open up their wallets yeah. and, and people don't necessarily always understand that right and I think that's the one thing that we always try and, and educate and set expectations with is that's like, the biggest thing yeah. you are going to spend this kind of money but you this is what you can expect to happen. Worst case, best case, you know, if things are going okay, this yeah. is, it's very difficult to really align expectations because every single person who either wants to start a business or has the goal to grow their business using digital marketing thinks it's a silver bullet. Yeah. Be and a lot of them have been burned by previous agencies, one, which is obviously a big pain point for us. But the second one is then going, oh, by the way, you are not going to grow your business overnight. Yeah. I hope that's okay. It's a long-term sure. It's a long term strategy. I, and I think that's such a good point because what we started to realize as well, as much as we are saying, okay, you're going to spend X and get a return or some type of return, I think what we've had to adapt to a lot better is, is setting those expectations because the client has to understand we are trying our utmost to get that return. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to promise every, anything, but all of our efforts are focused on nothing that's vanity metrics, you know, likes, followers, like your, like your T-shirt says. More sales, less likes. So that's what we try and focus on. So in the business owner's mind, we've had to like sort of play an education game where we're saying, listen, we can't promise you that we're going to get the most, like the most unbelievable return, but all our efforts are focused on just that. And that's the sort of area that we're trying to just focus on. You know what I've realized, right? And as you said it earlier about the actual return on, on revenue and, and return spend. on ad spend, is that we've slowly become a business a small business consulting agency to an extent. 100%. Because a lot of the business owners who we deal with, I mean, it's not just about that they, you know, need advice on online marketing, but sometimes they also need a lot of advice on how to convert customers. Absolutely. Uh, or put people into and you customers. start to advise them on the price of their products because you know how much you're getting a, a sale for or how much exactly. a click is. So now it's, it's exactly what you say. It's no longer just a marketing because it's linked to a business result. Yeah. You're partners in their business. You're telling them, we think this product's a bit too expensive. What's your margins on this? I was actually in a meeting with a company that does physical sales. So they want leads and then they actually phone the client and obviously okay. to convert them into a sale. We actually had to help them create sales scripts there because we noticed, I mean, when you go into our little world, you and my world, we, we're all about direct response. Yeah. Direct response is something that obviously this podcast is now obviously going to be about today and, and what it actually means. But you putting something directly online to get a response, right? But the res response is essentially that customer opening up their wallet. But it doesn't happen just by clicking on an ad. Yeah. So you have to t pick up the phone sometimes and occasions depending on the business. And you have to actually speak to the person. And what we've realized is because you know, we love direct response so much, we realize like they don't know how to sell the product. Yeah. Their own sales staff has no clue on how to approach the customer psychologically yeah. in order to make them feel comfortable with the actual sale. Absolutely. So the first thing that happens is like, hello, ma'am, can I, is this a good time to chat? No, it's not a good time to chat because it's a cold call. I can hear it a mile yeah. away. <laughs> can you phone me back tomorrow? Okay, no problem. <laughs> call never happens. And then the follow-up never happens as and, well. And the follow-up never happens. So yeah. I think for us, like we've become this bit of a consulting side, a small business consulting agency. Yeah. Because it's more, much more than just running paid ads. Absolutely. Um, it's actually, you know, trying to get real results, but there's so much more work that needs to go in on the back end. I think, yeah, that's a very, very good point. And just to build on what you've said is that you 100% take that, that position because if they, if you send them a list of 100 leads in a month and they only convert 10, they're going to say you're sending bad leads. So you actually need to help them on that education process of improving yeah. them on how to close the sales better and do all of that because your success hinges on it. Uh, exactly, 100%. So, I mean, social media, funnel building. Let's talk about, uh, I mean, social media is the awesome. one thing that you guys are specializing in. And, and from what I've heard, like us, luckily as well, like I think we're a bit more unique when it comes to most agencies. Um, and this is not trying to diss anybody in the space, obviously. Mm. But I think the majority of agencies do focus a lot on brand awareness, um, especially, the, you know, the bigger guys who yeah. work with bigger budgets because brand awareness is crucial for those companies when it comes to their market share. 
Um, in our case, we work with small budgets. We can't focus on brand awareness with a five grand, 10 grand budget because all that's going to get you is vanity metrics at the end of the day and you're not going to necessarily grow your business like that. So that's why di direct response plays such a huge role mm. um, in small businesses mm. because you need to make every penny count. So with that said, regarding the social media strategies that you've talked about before we started the podcast actually with the people didn't hear, yeah. um, let's elaborate some of those strategies and, and why do you think it's so powerful? Okay, awesome. So... I think the biggest thing that, that we realized, so to, to go back to the, the ebook and when I sold all those ebooks, was I made the, the journey as simple as possible. So, what we realized with a brand like ClickFunnels, which we use to drive most of our business results. Um, so, for the users that don't know what ClickFunnels is, it's basically an awesome um, software where you can build a one page landing page very, very quickly, which forms as a basis for your website, but you can control the whole customer journey. So what I realized with, with ClickFunnels was that the conversions were a lot higher because you know who you are targeting and who you're speaking to, so therefore you can build a complete sales funnel based on that. So what I mean by that is with the ebook, I was able to know exactly who I'm talking to and build out a set of funnels that resemble that. Whereas with a website, what we notice is when you send somebody to a website, and this is obviously, this is based on purely on our opinion and how we see the market, is that there's a lot of friction, you know, because there's the home, about us, the contact us. And a lot of the marketing that we do is top of funnel, so it's turning a complete stranger Correct. and asking them for the information. So the reason, our strategy and reason why we do funnel building is because you can turn somebody from a stranger to a customer or to a lead a lot quicker than sending them to a website. But that's from coming from Facebook. Exactly, and there's two things I want to touch on quickly is one, your website, and two, the funnels. So remind me about that because yeah. I've got the memory of a goldfish. goldfish. <laughs> so I almost said elephant, but that's like a complete opposite. So a very short-term memory uh, sucks completely. So please remind me if I do forget, but it's number one, the website, right? Mm. I use the analogy that that's your house. Yeah. And because the reason I'm going to dive into this analogy now is because a lot of times before someone spends money on their marketing, we do an audit on their site and go, sorry, so you, you know what? Your website's actually not ready to receive any traffic yeah. because one, it's slow, it's clunky, it's not beautifully designed. All you're going to do is chase people away. Yeah. They get offended and then they go, okay, cool, what do you mean exactly? And then I use, uh, then I use this analogy. My mom is Afrikaans, bless her soul. I hope she's listening to this. I love you with my whole heart. But <laughs> like she was, she was very strict when people used to come over, right? She used to beat my ass if things were out of place. And essentially, you know, if people were coming over, guests were coming over on a Saturday night, they kind of come, Brian, I'm talking like 12 to like 16 years old, right? Yeah. She'd be like, Yandre, we've got people coming over. Your room needs to be tidy. The dogs needs to be fed. Um, you know, you put your PlayStation games away. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so the whole house had to be in order, right? Yeah. And and the reason she did that because she had pride. Yeah. And she said, when someone comes over to my house, they're gonna have a good experience. Yeah. They have to have an amazing experience because if they don't have a good experience, they're never gonna come there again. There you go. There's the key. They're, they're not gonna come back. They're not gonna come back, and they're gonna tell other people about how dirty our house is and how you know just un unlikable you yeah. know the environment was. So I think for us as Afrikaans, I don't know. There's a lot of other cultures that are very similar. But for us, that was a big thing. People come over, you clean up everything, you yeah. make sure that they have a good experience, you shake hands at the end of the night, you stand up straight, cheers, bye. Yeah, come back, and the chance of them coming back is very high. 100%. Yeah. So, and that's just the similar. It's a very to, good analogy. It's I a like very it. similar. To, I love analogies. Yeah. It's the only way to get people to understand. But with that analogy, I think we kind of get it into the, 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 the business owner's mind that you know you need to just take care of your home. Yeah. If you don't, people are not going to come back. They're going to yeah. have a bad experience and they're not going to open their wallets to anything that you Absolutely. have to say yourself. And people, I think people nowadays are really, I know, and it's come a very, very long way, especially e-commerce. People are very, very, they're untrusting to things online. So if they hop onto your website and see that you have a bad website, they don't know if they're going to trust you. And that first impression, as you know, is everything. Yeah. The first impression is everything. So I think just to build on your analogy, if your website's your house, then ClickFunnels will be the build board on a specific highway. Yeah. I must add that there's obviously other tools in ClickFunnels. Like I know there's For like sure. some really other cool tools out For there sure. as well. But like I know we use Unbounce as a really awesome way to build landing mm. pages. So as for some value, Unbounce, ClickFunnels, um, what else comes to mind? I mean, even MailChimp now allows you to do landing pages, but it's to yeah. no extent as robust and awesome yeah. as ClickFunnels and, and some yeah. of the others. Fast Pages is another one if anybody wants to Google that, which is really cool. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on was funnel building. So we're using the word funnel building, but we're taking for granted that a lot of people might not know necessarily yeah. know what, that, what it is. So I think layman's terms, like how would you explain a funnel 
you know, front end, back end, all that kind yeah. of stuff? I think a, a funnel is basically just taking somebody from point A to point B. Mm. I think that's the simplest, the simplest. What's the journey? It's a customer journey. It's a, a sales funnel and it's controlled. So, you know, you're going to put this many people through the funnel and then this many people get to the end of it. And that's, that's all it is. It's just a predictable journey that you send people on. So I think the beauty about funnel building is, I think maybe if I'm skipping here, just let me know. When we um, run ads for companies, the first thing that we do is first determine what is a good strategy and then from there target who is their ideal customer. Mm. And then from there we're allowed to reverse engineer the process and then build out the funnel accordingly. Yeah. Where most people, they maybe take the shotgun approach, I might think, and then they just build any funnel. So I think when you might take the shotgun approach and you run ads to a website, you might you probably will get a couple of conversions, but the strategy that we do is it's very controlled and you can control the journey and get a predictable outcome from it. You measure the data. You measure and, the data, and, exactly. And, and by analyzing the data, you can make data-driven decisions that can help you improve the journey, your which will help improve your conversion rates, which will help you increase your profit. There you go. Nice. There you go. So, and I mean, you, there's also a lo lot of different types of funnels, right? You get front-end funnels, you get back-end funnels. So I'd like to maybe delve into that a little bit and go, so, I mean, front-end could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, same with the back end, but this is how I see it and this is how I explain it to business owners. Front end being the, 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 the almost like the stuff that, the, the work that you do on the internet and back end being the stuff that you do Behind off, the the scenes. Inter off yeah. of the internet. Okay. I mean, how do you see it? I thought front end was sort of what everybody sees, you know, like at face value and back end is all the changes you make that then affect I the front end. I suppose that too, yeah. yeah. But I mean, like email marketing, in my opinion, that would be part of a back-end back funnel. for sure. And even though you technically, you're not seeing that on social media. So you're not yeah. seeing it in your news feed, but you're seeing it directly in your own inbox, which is a lot more personal in the back-end yeah. of, of, of the customer journey. So I think from our side, from a front-end perspective, I know a lot of people have probably seen the actual funnel, right? Mm. The, the, you know, wide at the top and close at the bottom and brand awareness and engagement, and then you try and get them into a sale. So that ideally is something that you do on the internet and you can do all these kind of objectives on social media. And then on the back end, you've got your, your, the actual email sequences happening and SMSs being sent and maybe messenger bots okay. and all that kind of stuff. I mean, do you agree with what I'm saying? Or yeah, what? for sure. For okay, sure. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And then, then I want to ask from a front end perspective, what do you guys do and do well? And wh what do you think? not necessarily actually so much you guys because obviously you're doing a good job at it, but what do you think business owners need to focus on more from a front-end perspective? And what do you think business owners need to focus on more from a back-end perspective in order to really close that sale? So when you say front-end, just to confirm what you said, is it going to be top of funnel when you say front-end or not necessarily? No, I think it's just basically on social media. For example, you're targeting someone who d doesn't know who you are. That's a completely random person. Yeah. And ideally, you moving them down into the, you know, kind of like an awareness stage yeah. and you get them into the engagement phase. And then you kind of like showing them retargeting ads yeah. because they I'm going to throw you a, a curveball here. Sorry to interrupt you. I think mm. the way that we see it here is for us, the most, one of the most important things, you know, regardless of funnels and fancy websites and maybe targeting is the copy. Yeah. For us, the most important thing we feel in our opinion is the copy because what we see is that, you know, that usually the success of a paid media campaign hinges on how contextual you are. Hundreds. And when somebody can, when somebody really clicks on an ad and follows the funnel and goes into the process, it's when they feel like you're speaking exactly to them. 100%. So in, our, our, in my opinion, if we talk front end and let's just say moving somebody from top of funnel to bottom funnel, I would say is that it's in the copy and number one, letting your audience know very early on that you're speaking to them. So, you know, that's why you always see some people who run ads, they go, attention Pretoria or attention Cape Town, just to, just to build some that's point me. of yeah, contextuality and maybe warm them up to you. So I think what we do is we try our best to have at least three touches of contextuality and copy, and then from there, say what their problem is and offer a solution. What three touches do you usually focus on? Or does usually, it make, does usually it's the, the city, the type of person, and their sort of niche. Mm. So, you know, females in Cape Town who love gym, for example, just off the top of my head. So usually it's those three touches of contextuality that, in our opinion, makes us convert better with clicks and everything like that. And I think to answer your question, how this can apply to a business owner, I think when a business owner understands his audience a lot better and he understands exactly who he's talking to, because obviously that means he's a mature business owner and he's been in business a very long time, he'll be able to help us with that. And I think when you're either very niche or the business owner knows who they're talking to, it makes it a dream to write copy for. And that for us is the one of the most 
important factors to conversion. The most difficult thing that we found, we struggle with sometimes, is that the business owners that we you know, would start a journey with, we don't know who we're targeting and they exactly. also don't know. Exactly. Um, you know, we need to discover that together because mm. they would be like, well, it's a new business and this is ideally who I want to target, but we, they actually don't know if that's the customer that's going to respond. We made a video the other day, sorry to interrupt you, we, did, we compared it to that scene in Alice in the Wonderland. So Alice gets to the tree and then that, that Garfield lynx cat or yeah. whatever is in the tree. And then the cat comes out and Alice is like, so uh, Alice says to the cat, where, which, where should I go? Which direction? And the cat says, well, where do you want to go? And Alice is like, well, I'm not sure. And the cat says, well, it doesn't matter which way I tell you to go then. Because you, you don't know where you want to go. <laughs> so true, man. That's, I love that. Yeah. That's, so that's, that's what we compare the copy to and the contextuality. Because if a business owner expects you to market something, but he doesn't even know himself who his customer is, you know, that's, that's quite tricky. So that's why we say, you know, you can make the best video or you can make the best, you know, the best edited image. Yeah. But copy for us is where the magic happens because it really gets, allows you to speak to somebody yeah. and do that problem solution scenario and get contextual. The environment is so noisy. So you need to find something that, you know, gets their attention immediately. And I think the other part of that conversation would then also be creative, I'm assuming, right? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think, and this is, again, purely opinion-based, I think that the creative is very important, but I think maybe if you if we look at if you look at social as a whole, like a Facebook, Instagram ads, I think people are very very busy, and sometimes they you know in a meeting in the office and they can't always listen to a creative with the volume on. So that's what we sort of compare it to. And most people spend their time you know either on their way to work or at work or something like that. So we say that we always write a bit a little bit longer copy because we think that if number one. They won't complain that your copy is too long if you are really speaking to them in their, in their problems and solutions. We've seen that. Yeah. Exactly. So for us, what we're doing is, and to answer your question, but better is make it all about the customer and the copy. All about the customer, because a lot of, and it's always like it's almost like counterintuitive. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. you want to market your product, but you don't want to mention the product. You want to make it all about them, and they will then themselves come to the conclusion that okay, this product is the problem to my. Or yeah. the solution to my problem, sorry. 100%. So I think that, that's what we've seen. So funnel or no funnel, obviously funnel has its place. And I'm sure you'll agree with this. Copy is like the magic of the online so world. So we put a lot of time and effort into copy. We actually hired someone uh, full-time to assist with copy. Brilliant. Um, I love that. You know, even though she's a good campaign manager, I think her forte is understanding copy and the actual user. So it and brings, it's a, a tough skill to find. It's eh? a very tough skill to find. And it's, it's something that people take for granted because people mm. think you can just slap uh, like, words onto this it. is the price this is the solution to your problem buy it now exactly and it doesn't necessarily work like that you need to get them out of that noisy environment and 9 out of 10 times people are going to go like who are you why, yeah. why am I buying this from you yeah, why are you wasting my attention how do I know that you really have my best intentions uh, exactly. at heart you know and, and I think that's why we had Charles uh, Shane on last uh, last week and he talked about building stories for your business okay. because the story is essentially what connects the customer with your brand and builds trust and credibility so if you the higher the ticket item that you sell the more you need to connect with the customer longer the copy so, exactly the longer the copy and also longer the journey sometimes yeah. as well because they need to see you once or twice and get a feel of who you are and if you have a good story you've just shortened that time span of the connection absolutely and as well on that point with qualifying your own lead if somebody's not going to read you know the copy that you've written they might not potentially be a good lead for you 100%. therefore they're not going to click on your ad and you won't waste you know your money on that person per se so i mean we were talking about one of your clients who's had some success um you know from from a back-end funnel perspective where you said you were trying to drive people to the actual store or to the actual location and that worked quite well and you mentioned, I would say in my mind, I would call it the back end funnel, which is the email sequences. Okay. And I think from, from the, that perspective, what do you think made that successful? Because now we've talked about the front end. You have to have good copy. You have to have good creatives. And I mean, additional stuff like have a call to action, like click yeah. here and learn more and download or whatever. But essentially, that's, that, it doesn't stop there. And people think it does. People yeah. think once they've clicked this, the money is in the bank. Yeah, yeah. And that's when the hard work actually starts. Right? Sure. That's when the hard work starts. And the higher the ticket item that you're trying to sell, the more back-end hard work you need to do. Absolutely. So with regards to that, I think, how would you guys approach that? And, and what did you do for your client that you, you, you mentioned like had some really good success? Well, I think, first of all, to answer your question in the the shortest way possible, I think the first way, if we talk back in, so somebody has come in through your funnel, they've put in their name, email address, and cell phone number because they want this amazing offer that this particular business has offered them, I think the most important thing there is to create as little friction as possible. And our way of doing that is by sending an email, just a simple email saying, hey, this is who we are, 
welcome to the family. And if you need any questions or you have any queries, click below now to call. And for us, there's nothing, there's no easier way to, to get something in the door once they click call and they call you. And in their mind, you've erased all the objections as to is this person real? Is it really going to happen? Et cetera, et cetera. So I think maybe it's a disappointing answer, but no, as not. simple as possible, a simple email with a link very clearly say click here to call us making it as easy as somebody to pick up the phone and call a business yeah. and in their mind there's nothing else stopping them from coming into the store you've done the real so the so the, the maybe your, your listeners can understand better we've done a Facebook ad that's taken them to a landing page where they get offered something then on that landing page they put in their details to claim this amazing offer and then they get taken to the thank you page so, no something I want to mention there sorry to interrupt you is that the more attractive the offer the less back-end work you have to do. Absolutely. So if, Absolutely. You, if you are giving away a free session, if you're giving away, get your first month free, if you're giving away 50% off, then one email or one interaction after that click might actually be, suffi might actually be sufficient. Absolutely. It might actually suffice. But if your offer sucks, sorry for the lack of a better word, Rick, yeah, because that's actually what it comes down to, it does. is that you're going to have to put a lot more effort into the back end in order to get that person to open up their wallets. And often, often time, the putting more effort into the back end, or if it's front end, is probably just going to spend a bit more money to reach more people. Because often, as well as enough, there's a lot of people, they, especially in the online world as well, I think a lot of people copy each other. So people think if they're doing this, then I also need to do this. And I think mm. that's why I'm not hating on anybody or any gyms or stuff like that. But for this particular client, we didn't do what everybody else was doing. So that's why we saw the good results. And then I think for gyms, everybody does the free trial or the mm. you know, five days for free or something like that. Correct. Where the consumer knows that they're going to come in and they're going to be pitched for endlessly on to sign a membership yeah. so we we went the different route we made an absolutely irresistible offer and by the way i think that's this is what it hinges on as well is that people online are are selfish in the sense that it's, it's got to be all about them because social media is a form of entertainment so they're going to be scrolling on their news feed and for you to break their attention and get them to click on an ad when we know the stats are what the click through rate is 0.5 to 1.5 percent right so it's a very, very small amount of people. Depends on the channel, yeah. Depends yeah. on the, sorry, very on Facebook. Average, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So um, to get something to click on an ad, it has to be an, an irresistible offer. So something that's so good that the person will think, I'm silly not to take this offer. Yeah. And that's, I think that's also what it boils down well, to. Well, at least I'm silly not to learn more. Exactly, like yeah. I'm silly not to click on this ad. No, yeah. I never click on ads <laughs> type of thing. So I think that's what we, we try to set up with this, with this client in uh, particular. I think, uh, uh, you know, just a quick note I want to so say on the side, like I purposefully click on ads because I want to see, if I enjoy the ad, right? Yeah. Even if I'm not going to buy it, I purposefully click on it so I want to tell Facebook that I want more of that. Yeah. Because it's all about your experience on Facebook. Absolutely. So I had people say, no, I don't click on ads because then you're going to get to see more. Dude, you're going to see the exact same amount of ads in your newsfeed. You Facebook might as well... knows everything, guys. Facebook knows But not everything. just that. You're going to see ads in your newsfeed whether you click on them or not. Yeah. So rather click on them so that you can tell Facebook what you like so it can yeah. improve your experience. So Facebook's yeah. like, if you're going to be here, we're going to show you ads. <laughs> so you're either going to have shitty ads because you're not telling us what you like. Exactly. Or you're going to have a great experience because you've told us what you like. And I think whenever I see a good ad, I save it. Like if it's something that I you know in, in the marketing related software related I'll be like hey that's a good ad I'll save it or I'll click like or I'll click share and I'll share it with someone in the team and I'm just starting to see more of stuff that I'm really interested in so yeah. I think the Facebook is not there to you know cry and ruin your experience yeah they obviously run a, want to run a, want to run a profitable business for sure and you can if you're going to use the platform you might as well make the experience good for yourself I think that's a very interesting sort of insight I've actually never heard that before to be quite honest with you and I think that's an awesome idea because I think if you're going to start clicking on the ads to, and tell Facebook that this is what I like, and for the users that maybe don't know how the algorithm works, but the algorithm is basically working by, by your interactions. So the stuff that you click on, uh, the st people that you react with. And I'm speaking for Facebook now, usually, and John, you can tell me if I'm incorrect or correct here, usually the first thing you're going to see, well, they're, ba they're based on engagement, sorry. So when you go into your Facebook newsfeed, the first thing you're going to see is family, usually, because those are the people that you're the most engaged with. Then you're going to see maybe your more friends, distant friends, and you're going to see an ad. So an ad is always going to be there, like you say, and you might as well tell Facebook that I like this type of ad and I want to see more of it. Well, that's exactly like you can open your Facebook app now and scroll down the third post. I can guarantee you now I'm willing to bet you. It's an ad from V8. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's do it. Just do this quickly, right? We're going to actually do this. Op open, do me a favor. Open your phone. The third or fourth post is going to be an ad. Like it's usually the third I and fourth. I it's post. always, yeah. It's always it's, third. It's, it's third or fourth. Okay, so I'm Just going on now. One, oh, number two. Right, ah, I'll cover so the brand. <laughs> number number two. two. So start from the scratch again. Number one, whoop, number two. 
So the second thing. Then let's so see number three, number four, and number five, and number six should be at Aggie. Oh, not. Number seven. Yeah, number seven. Okay. Number so seven. after like six or seven posts, you would have seen two ads already. And I think essentially you ruining your own experience if you're not if you if you're not really one of those people who don't engage with the platform. Yeah. So my wife is one of those, uh, you know, just fights the system. <laughs> yeah. She no, she doesn't fight it purposely. She just she just like stares at it and be like, oh, that's cool, that's cool. She never engages. Yeah. So I'm trying to encourage her to engage because you're making your own. Exp- if you want to be on Facebook, you may just make. Ex- your that's own such a good better. point. My brother, you're saying to me the other day, he's, we're sitting at dinner and he's like, Carl, why did I see this ad or why did this ad tell me that I like this page when I don't? I, I'm like, and I don't want to click on it. I'm like, but Brian, did you like the ad? He's like. You know, I actually kind of did. It's almost like people feel like they're giving a part of themselves or they're conceding 100%. by clicking the ad. You know yeah. what I mean? No, I don't want to tell you that. I don't I like want to tell you that I like this. I don't want you to make my experience better. <laughs> Dude, the social media landscape is obviously changing. And I mean, the Facebook knows more about ourselves than we know, you know, about us. About us. And I think one thing I've realized is, uh, in, in my opinion, and this is where data comes in because we just touched on data. Mm. And... I don't know, for those of you who are listening, I don't know if you know what a lookalike audience is, right? But it's basically you telling Facebook that you're looking for similar people than people that you have data on. So, for example, if you have an email list, you can upload that to Facebook and you can say, hey, Facebook, I want to find more people who look like this group of individuals whose emails I've just given you or contact numbers or maybe there was, and now I'm going to get very granular but it's, and it's going to fly over a lot of people's heads but if you have like a, 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 con, a custom conversion on your site, which you can obviously track, which you can tell Facebook you want to see more of those. I'm so glad you said that. Sorry, so to fin- no, yeah. I'd be, just to finish off is that I obviously run our own ads for VA Media. It's something I love doing. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to always ensure that I'm the one doing our own marketing. I enjoy it as head of growth. Obviously, that's also my responsibility. Yeah. But every morning I would have a look, look at the data. And one thing I've experienced for our clients and even for ourselves, the lookalike audiences are always crushing it compared to interest targeting because of the fact that Facebook has so much data on people. On everybody. Right? I think that's such, such an awesome, awesome point. And two things real quickly, so I'll, I'll give some context to it. The, going back to the story that I told you about me selling eBooks wasn't because I was a, a very, very good marketer at that stage or I learned a lot. So what I actually did, and if there's any of my super yacht brothers and sisters watching this, I apologize for this. What I did was I took all the yachts that I worked on and I took their master list. So a master list is basically um, all the crew's information and where they should be on the super yacht. I took everybody's email addresses. I took everybody's cell phones. Whoa. I took one boat, the that's, other boat, that sounds the third boat, legal. the fourth boat, and I took everything and I uploaded it to Facebook and it was about a three 300 person audience. Then there was something on the yachts called Antibes Yacht Crew. But all that means was when you first fly down to France to start looking for a job, everybody would go onto this Facebook group and post a photo of themselves. They'll say, hey, my name is so-and-so. I'm from New Zealand and I'm looking for a job on this type of boat. And that all attached their CV. So I sat the whole day, copied the email address, pasted it into the CSV and did that that the whole time until I had an email list of a thousand people. I love it. And then for the users that are wondering if this worked or not and I want the business owners listening to do the exact same thing, I then took that and it's as simple as this guys uploaded it to facebook created a lookalike audience then i knew that the people who were looking for jobs on the super yachts were young south africans english people so in britain yeah new zealand and australia and all i did i did no age targeting no layering Just i said lookalike. lookalike audience spend i think it was like at that stage 50 dollars per day and i was getting a purchase i spend one dollar and i get three dollars out crazy pure profit so on Jandre's point, look like audience is incredible. Yeah. And that goes back to how Facebook knows everything about us and their data is impeccable. And you've got to make the most of it, right? You've got to make the most of it. Look, there's all these tips and tricks that you know, we'll, we'll obviously talk about in, in later episodes and stuff like that. But I think from, from our side, that is very accurate. Look like audiences work like a bomb. And that's definitely something I've seen in our own business and also for our clients. Yeah. Lookalikes do. Uh, we've seen in cases where lookalikes don't do well, it's when the, the, the actual business owner had r- the wrong data. They actually and maybe bought, the pixel, there we are, no, the wrong. they actually bought a list. They bought oh, an really? email list, for example. Or, yeah. you know, they would just, so they would say, we want to look alike to everybody who's visited our website, you know, in the last 90 days. But then we come on board and they didn't tell us that they had an agency who had shitty targeting. Yeah. So because of that agency that had shitty targeting before we were able to come into the to the scene and improve the traffic, we our, our data was contaminated. Yeah. So we told Facebook, hey, we want more people like this. We want more bad people. Yeah, we want more bad people. Yeah, give us and more Facebook shitty did. people. What did Facebook do? <laughs> did its job. <laughs> exactly. So for, for your business owners that are listening, I think 
a lot of a lot of business owners that we meet with, and I'm sure you'll be the same, have this huge huge list of emails, and they just think that it's like it's just like chilling there. Yeah. Like you guys have got to utilize this. So take find somehow you can even if you get somebody to sit and do it all day, take all the emails that you have. Get a platform like MailChimp, which is free to use up until the first 2,000 people, and maybe this will help you guys drive some type of business result. Take those emails, upload them to MailChimp, and do one email blast, and then take those emails, upload it to Facebook, create the lookalike audience, and then run one ad. And I think you guys are going to thank us. I think so too. Um, from my side, I just wanted to ask, do you take the emails that you've, are you, are you saying you take the emails that you've uploaded, or take the emails that have opened because the ones that Good are point. opened, Good yeah. point. So in my opinion, if you have a big enough database, the yeah. ones that are open are obviously more relevant. And I think I think I think that's a very very good point because that will then allow you to know the people that are more engaged than if it's obviously a real email I address. Think. But I think as well, a lot of a lot of like people in the service based industry or you know dentists or doctors or something like that who have so much lists on their patients, that'll be the the best way for them to to mm. make. I think money the quickest way using digital marketing because they have something ridiculous like if, it, if the practice has been around for four or five years they've got a list of like 10 to 15,000 people without a doubt because yeah. they get so much traffic and volume coming into their practices so I think for them if they want to grow that'll be the best way hands down I think that's, a, I that's a, a growth hack for you guys no for sure and I'm excited to hear some feedback if anybody's going to try that dude so I mean we talked about social media and it, and it is a powerful platform no matter where you are like tiktok is exploding and we can see how much attention that's got um twitter probably not as much anymore yeah. and, and it's not an environment where you can run direct response ads necessarily no. so i'm going to leave that one um but instagram and facebook is doing extremely well but more so i think my concern is where is the landscape where, where is this going like where do you see it going at least like because i there's, there's so many directions that could probably go. Yeah. Um, but I would love to know where, where you think it's going. This is, look, this is my, my favorite topic because I think you, similar to me in the sense that you're, you're a business owner and you like to think ahead. And I think, I don't think social media is going anywhere. I think it's here to stay. I just think the conversation will be around where is the underpriced attention going to continue to be. So for the users listening and wondering what that means, right now, uh, Facebook and Instagram, as Jono just said, to advertise on the platform is unbelievably, I wouldn't say cheap, but it's underpriced attention. You can reach a lot of people for a very good price and be very targeted. The, the conversation then changes when more people start to discover how, how effective you know, marketing online becomes. What happens is more people jump on the advertising platform, and that makes the cost to advertise on these platforms more expensive. So what starts to happen is where you were, you know, when I was getting, spending $1 and getting $3 out, if I had to try that right now and it was three years ago, I'll probably spend $1 and maybe get $2 mm. out mm. because now there's more competition and there's more people bidding for the High. attention of the people I'm targeting. Higher cost per clicks. Higher cost per clicks. So if we talk social media landscape, I think we're seeing this, and I'm sure you'll agree, with the overseas clients, the, the CPM is going up very like rapidly every day. CPM is the cost to reach 1,000 people, and that's going going up very, very quickly. I think it will just be it will be somebody's going to either dethrone Facebook or Instagram, like a TikTok maybe, and that will then become the best platform to advertise on and we will just have to you know, adjust accordingly. Mm. I think our strategies will never change in the sense that we, we partner with businesses to drive business goals based on the platform where there's underpriced attention. I think that that will never change. I think we'll always be looking for that arbitrage of where's the, the best deal. And to be honest with you, for the chance of us being historically correct in camera, I'll hear your um, your bet afterwards. I think TikTok will eventually dom be dom will dominate Facebook and Instagram. That's just my my two cents. And I think people's main concern with TikTok now is that it's it's young and all the kids are on it. But Facebook was the same thing when I was in school. I was the one of the youngsters that were on Facebook, and my parents wanted nothing to do with it. And now it's just parents on Facebook. It's, right. li it's literally just parents on Facebook, and now there's no kids. All the kids are on. Young people are on Instagram and on TikTok. Yeah. So I think I think TikTok is going to give a good run for its money for Facebook and Instagram because you know how the platforms go. It's the platform gets launched, the organic reach is through the roof, and then once the organic reach starts to go down, the advertising platform comes out, and yeah. then that's very underpriced for four or five years. So I think that's my that's my prediction if we talk about social media in the next couple of years. Yeah, I agree a lot with what you're saying. I think there's just a lot of concerns around you know. There's so many variables that could yeah. that would play a part in you know the prediction, but in essence, social media is not going away. I don't think so. I see now also instant messaging is uh, surpassed social media usage, so instant messaging oh, is wow. a is a big thing. Uh, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Facebook Messenger. We're sitting with 
80% open rates. Like, it's ridiculous. It's like back in email in 1995. Yeah. So, in essence, I think, like you said earlier, it's like, where is all the attention and where is it underpriced? And nine out of ten times, I think the future is instant messaging and, and, and social media. Instant messaging will play a, a huge role and I think commerce uh, for most certainly because you yeah. now can already incorporate you know, stuff like your buying and selling on, on Facebook Messenger. Integrates with PayPal, integrates with Stripe. It's not going to be long before a company like Payfast you know, does the exact same thing. But I think with regards to TikTok, it's funny because even though people say it's youngsters, uh, you know, in teenagers, we forget that depending on the brand that you are, it's the teenager that influences the mom or the, or the person buying for their sure. decision. For so sure. that teenager goes, hey, mom, I want to get this. And like, what is that? Oh, da, 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 da. It's 500 yeah, bucks. Sweet. Here's 500 bucks. Go buy it. So even though you didn't target the mom, you target the teenager who influenced his mom to buy whatever yeah. he wanted to, to buy. So it's not available to advertise on the platform on a paid perspective. It's not available in South Africa yet, but I do, I'm, I'm licking my lips yeah. because I'm keen. I see there's a lot of, I've been seeing ads and on TikTok and I do think it's going to be an exciting platform to test out. We did an ebook on it, which actually elaborates all the different ways that you can advertise on it. There's some okay. really cool things that you can do. But from, from my perspective, I think never underestimate Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a very it, good point. It, it, I do agree that when you say Facebook, you talk about the Facebook platform and I agree that it is, probably in a decline but also when you've reached 90% or 80% of the world like where do you go yeah after where's that? the yet your roof right because between between whatsapp between facebook between instagram i think we worked it out obviously there will be an overlap of audiences but i think he's reaching like 60 or 70% of the of population. the whole world so that's scary where, where do you go um after that yeah and uh also you know what i do agree that it's a good point. TikTok eh? is, is coming up. It's these teenagers. These teenagers are going to have spending power in the next 10 years. Yeah. And they're going to be used to TikTok. Yeah. So Facebook is in trouble. They need to adapt, find ways to, you know, I think they already tried a competitor for TikTok, which didn't work. In Brazil, right? That was, I, yeah. I think so, yeah. yeah they already tried work. a competitor, didn't work. Um, they, you know, they've t taken Snapchat out of the game. So sure, I won't yeah. be surprised if they've got some ideas in order to... They definitely have a secret room somewhere where it's just, how do we take TikTok <laughs> out of the game? <laughs> For sure. And if I have to put money on Mark or the company... Uh, what is that? It's like some Chinese company who owns TikTok. Uh, yeah. um, based on Mark's history, I would probably back Mark. Yeah. Um, just based on the fact that, you know, he's been in it for 20 years and he's, what, 35 or 38 now still? So he's still got a lot of fight in him. Yeah. But my... I don't really have a prediction, to be honest. I, I don't know. There's too many things that will happen. I, I don't want to be, what is it, Notre Dame. Uh, but I, I think wherever the attention is going to go, that's obviously where we'll end up be, going. Yeah. And, for the, and for the users listening, I'm sure you can agree with us, it's so nice to have organic reach on a platform again. Crazy. Facebook Facebook is was one percent. So if you have a thousand people that like your page, that means you're gonna reach what one to two percent of them. It's the only social platform. Sorry to interrupt you. Where you can get more views than the followers that you have. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So and then Instagram, we're looking at what five to ten percent organic reach. Mm -hmm. So if you make a post, five to ten percent of of the people that follow you will see it. TikTok is the opposite. It's like 300% because yeah. you can start with three followers and your views can be 1,000 or 10,000 or 20,000. And that for me is something that I didn't realize or appreciate before I started posting on TikTok because it's now that I'm in the world where we spend money for reach, we're getting all this free reach. Yeah. It's absolutely free, not spending a cent on it. The other thing I wanted to say is that from a TikTok perspective, um, it, it's crazy to see that you can have three followers and get 300 views. Uh, it's not something that exists today. But the problem is, is that when it comes to brands, and this is where brands probably can take my, my two cents, you know, seriously or not, I don't know. But it's very time, con it's very, you, there's a lot of time and effort that goes into creating a TikTok video. Because at the end of the day, like if you want to do a, an amazing TikTok video, TikTok video, it's not like Instagram where you do a story and you leave it. It's little bites of snippets that you have to put together if you want to do it right. Like I've heard that the average, you know, TikTok influencer spends about 30 minutes to an hour creating an actual video. Can Some I tell you why I disagree with you? Can huh? I tell you why I disagree with Go you? For it. I disagree with you because I think the nature of TikTok, because it's more of a younger audience who's grown up with their cell phones and stuff like that, their yeah. attention span is a lot less, meaning they can consume a quick 10 to 15 second video. Have you ever made, you would know, would you ever made a YouTube video? You make a 10 minute YouTube video, you have to plan it, record it, chop it up so it makes sense, color grade it, edit it, make sure the audio is okay. To make one YouTube video that's 10 minutes and good is about seven to eight hours. TikTok, mean you can make, make a TikTok now. Mean you can make a TikTok right now and, and reach 
plenty of okay i i agree with that 100 percent, i do but what i'm saying is for a brand if you want to create entertaining content it's not something where you just pull out your phone and that's what my opinion is is like yeah. we were at a, a company today uh, a food chain Sorry. who we think would be ideal for tiktok and you're sitting there trying to come up with creative ways because you can't just go and, and make a random video. It might work today. It's not going to work yeah. because of the organic growth that will decline over time. You need to come up with entertaining content because people go to TikTok to be entertained. Yeah. They don't go there here's to... A, here's you know the thing, what I'm though. I, I know exactly what you're saying and I agree with you. I think this is where, where corporates and bigger companies have to try to figure out how to be more human. That's exactly Because they try, they try and incorporate their big video teams. And that's teams. the friction I'm talking about. Yeah, that's, I can understand that. Whereas if the CEO had to make... Not you and me, not you, not John and Mary and myself. For sure. You. Like we can literally make a TikTok in five seconds and it'll get views. But if you're a brand trying to make sales, you're going to have to think it out and be like, how do we get... Because now also you need to find the bridge between being entertaining and your offer. So mm. you're like, who... Because ideally you well, can... This is my, yeah, this is my debate. I think, I think when you have organic reach like this, I think you should just be all light entertaining. And once you build up that arbitrage and build yeah, up that following, then you can sell. And I think if, if the CEO of a huge corporate company had to just take his TikTok out and tell a joke of something that he heard funny or one of his staff members Elon did. Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Imagine Elon Musk told a knock-knock joke. I'd watch that TikTok. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think yeah. that's where they must... And to be honest with you, the only reason I'm saying this now is because like, I know how it is to make a YouTube video. And then with Instagram photos, like the culture of Instagram now is you have to have the perfectly edited um, video. So, I mean, you have to, with Instagram, you have to have the perfectly edited photo because, you know, you've got to put those filters on it yeah. and you have to make it look rich and stuff. That yeah. takes so long. And you do it for, do it, and then only 5% of your viewers are going to reach it. Yeah. So with TikTok, I've learned that, you know, you just stop overthinking it because now where social media is now, it's just a volume game. Yeah. Well, volume and quality, but rather lack one of those and not post at all. So you're you actively posting on TikTok? I'm actively posting jokes on TikTok. Please don't watch it. It's cringe. <laughs> <laughs> How many followers do you have? I, don't I know. have... Oh, this is going to be awesome. I think I have 3,000. What? I have 3,000 followers. So I had, I had one video that went viral. So what I did was I actually did a video ripping off load shedding. And it got, I'll tell you now how much it got. 122,000 views. So when, this was the third video that I'd ever posted. Oh, you, you TikTok famous then? <laughs> kind of, I guess so. But I mean, it's all just me being, not taking myself very seriously. Yeah. So the third video I ever posted for the viewers listening was a 10 second video that took me 10 minutes to edit. And I posted online ripping off, ripping off load shedding, and it got it got 122,000 views. And at that Can stage, I, I had video about. Can you ripping off yeah. load shedding? I don't interest. I had about. We're gonna have to put this put it, on the video. I had about. I just want to think. I had a hundred. Had a hundred. Hundred followers at that stage. It's and it's Which so one cringe. is it? The bottom, and it'll be the one of my face there. Which one is this now? Yeah, all the way on the right. Oh, this one. Top right. Oh, that's, that's the one. one. Hundred. Start it again. It just basically can I, can I reverse it? Yeah, you can go up and then down. Go up and then down again. Uh, there we go. South Africans, I've got some really, really Let me do this. Wait, wait. Hey, South Africans, I've got some really, really good news for us. There will never, never, never be blood shedding again. <laughs> when did he say that? He said it, I think it was like two and a half hey, years ago. <laughs> so I just jumped on it. That's so, so cool, man. Yeah, that was very, very quickly. So it's got nothing to do with business. It's got nothing to do with the agency. That's and fine. People all of it. you on an emotional level. So that's what I thought. I'm like, there's never going to be an opportunity for this to be such good organic growth. And yeah. you know what? Let me make a fool of myself. And now every single video you've made, you've been like, oh, can I get it? Can I get yeah. it? Can I get it? After that, I never had one that ranked like that again. So the first one was 13K. Then I had a video... But I've, okay, I've had two after that. I had one that had three, sorry, 40K, 80K, and 87K. Did you use hashtags in that video out of interest? Hashtags, yeah. But the difference, is, okay, this is where I'm maybe being a bit hypocritical. I know how to edit videos on Adobe Premiere Pro. So what I did was I'd, I'd record the front-facing camera of like a, a punch. Then I would take a snippet of something that's funny and drag it into the video and then do the, you know, the climax like the joke. Listening. Are you listening, Shay? You can, you're going to come sit with Shay for like uh, a day and just explain to him how to make TikTok videos for, for the media. <laughs> So yeah, that's, that's, I think TikTok is unbelievable in that sense. My audience, if you ask me what my audience is, I did a live the other day. My small audience is 12 to 13-year-old girls. <laughs> so it's got absolutely nothing to do with so my digital marketing. So many bad jokes I can make right now. <laughs> so my, it's got nothing to do with my digital marketing agency, but I think... But they're going to own businesses 20 years from but now. But maybe in 5 <laughs> or 10 years' time, I'll remember, now. oh, that guy made jokes. Oh, he also does digital marketing. Yeah. So I think... I her, think her mom is going to say tonight, yeah, I wish I had a, a, a person that does digital marketing. <laughs> and she's like, mom, mom. <laughs> I don't know anybody, but I know a guy who makes really bad jokes on TikTok. <laughs> so I think, I think that's, that's coming down to, you know, I think 
brands as well and maybe corporates, they say, Gary Vee says it all the time, they say no to everything. Yeah. As opposed to, I'm sure you've tried, you've dabbled in TikTok, we have to just say yes to everything. Say yes and try something and then beyond reasonable of a doubt, if it doesn't make business sense and you lose money, then you say no to it. But I think you've got to try and dabble. And you know what the weird thing is? I am turning 32 this year and I think I've played around with TikTok, nothing too, uh, nothing too serious though. But my, my thing is, is that I think my mind is... I'm like the internet dinosaur guy. So I'm the <laughs> guy that was, when I was 22, it was 2000 and like what? 13, 10, 2007. Yeah, 10 or whatever. So yeah, the, just 2009. And I think that's when the internet for me boomed. So my mindset, you know, needs to be adapted. Luckily, you know, we've got ladies like Tamsin and Melissa and Gilbert. Yeah, like and that, so we have a team blood. of people that can obviously take care of it. But from my side, it's like when I'm trying to think creatively about TikTok, I am struggling. I need to spend more time on the platform to, to actually see, you know, what people are let me Let me also say this. A lot of what people on TikTok do is they copy trends and they copy other people. Yeah. So that ma that video, maybe it was a, a bit original, but to be completely honest with you, the rest of the videos was me just taking somebody else's, you know, bit, which is like a comedy I, sketch, and idea, yeah. incorporating it into my own. And I think that's what makes TikTok a bit more fun and entertaining yeah. and stuff like that. So I think... You're not, it's not that you're overthinking that in the beginning when you look at TikTok and you watch all these kids dancing and stuff it's like shuffling what, or something shuffling and renegade renegade you're like what on earth is going on here I don't get this but I think as well there was that type of content on Facebook and Instagram and then there was those yeah. the pioneers that made their type of content their own on the platform the big question I have and this is what I have for every single platform why why does it have so much attention so that is the question we need to ask ourselves because you si we're sitting here going, we need to create this kind of content, this works well. You need to take a step back as a business owner and you go, you need to ask yourself, why does the platform have the attention it has? Why do people take their phone out for TikTok and why do they sit on it for hours even though it's just six... People go... Snippets, yeah. This is what people go, I'm impatient, but then you spend two hours on TikTok. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But it's sure. because it's maybe short bites of, and every one is new and you can decide which one you want to delve into and which one not. And I think, and you can tell me what you think about this, I think a multitude of reasons. I think reason number one, where TikTok was smart was they made it as easy as possible to share TikTok on other platforms. I saw that, yeah. That, that, that was a big thing. I picked thing. it up immediately, yeah. That was a big thing because most likely you discovered... It's such a stupid thing. Like, why does, yeah. why does everybody else make it so difficult? Thank you. When you go from Instagram to YouTube, they, Instagram automatically signs you out of going to YouTube. So when you have to subscribe, you have to sign back into YouTube. Oh Whereas word. TikTok, they made it e as easy as possible, like seamless to share TikTok's content on all the platforms. And I think that was the big thing. So number one, the shareability factor was... And I honestly saw Musical.ly and TikTok for the first time from Facebook and Instagram because somebody had shared that on the platform. The second thing is I think that it's, it's just um, it's catering to our small attention spans. Well, and that's just everybody. I think yeah. technology has made our attention spans and every year it's getting less and less. Yeah, every... Sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, and then I think the big thing, for me, the biggest thing, because I'm so... I love music so much. Like, that's what we work to all day. Like, we have music playing all the time was the music factor. YouTube, Instagram, Facebook never got it right because they would take mm, your mm. content down if it had copyright in it. TikTok, it's the opposite. But, I mean, this is now the question. I don't think TikTok... Uh, Sorry, I don't think Facebook and Instagram did it on purpose, though. They yeah. uh, didn't have the rights to distribute their music. Yeah. I think Musical.ly, from what I understand, because of Musical.ly, they actually had the rights to the songs. And they have somehow licensed a lot of... A lot of uh, mu mu uh, also, sorry, um, before I stumble my, well, my wording here, <laughs> but one thing is that they had a lot of songs licensed, and two, because it's like six seconds or something, or th it's not actually an oh, infringement. So it's, it's enough to be... It's enough to not be a copywriting. So that's, that's a good that's point. That's what I've read, though. I don't know how accurate this is. This is my I think that's very accurate, because I know with the Instagram story, which we've tested, six or seven seconds, you get by, you don't get flagged. If you make an, a copyrighted song longer than 20 to 30 seconds on an Instagram story, mm. boom, it gets flagged, and your story gets taken down. So whether, and I think that's maybe what... Uh, it's debatable whether yeah. TikTok has licensed all the songs or because TikTok knows that if you play a snippet of a song, yeah. you can't get flagged. I think either way, they were very smart. Look, there's songs that I like that I go and find on, on uh, music because now I see on TikTok, you can click the song and then a lot of them will actually have an Apple Music where you can actually find that full track on Apple exactly. Music. And the difference is that people are becoming famous. Like people say, oh, that's that TikTok song. It's yeah. not the musician. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's that TikTok song. That's exactly that's it. The, that's the thing. It's that like TikTok the mannequin song. song. Like, the, you remember the, the, ma song? the mannequin? 
Yeah, yeah, the yeah. The Mannequin yeah, Challenge? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's the Mannequin Challenge song, whatever. Like, yeah. And, I think and the Harlem Shake, remember the that Harlem, one? Yeah, so sick. I think in essence, it's actually to a favor, it's, it's in favor of the artists because more, more people are seeing your name with, with your you know, work. Have you seen how happen. people actually monetize TikTok? I, you, what do you mean? Like making money out of it? Out of their own organic reach or advertising? Organic reach. Not advertising. Organic. So, organic. I haven't seen. So people are making TikTok, and this was a discovery that I only realized three weeks to a month ago, is that people, creators, make money on TikTok when they do a live. So what happens is they go, because lives on TikTok are huge, they would literally do a live, and then the creators have all these little options at the bottom of their screen. And that can be, you know, send them a teddy bear, or send them a Roman flower, or send them a, a, a Russian, something else like that. And all the gifts are linked to coins, and the oh. coins are what the users put on their phone and buy. So what? there's a, I'm sorry if I'm saying this, there's a girl called, her name is either Shantae or Megan, she's in Pretoria. She's 20, 20 years old. None of those names are even close to really the same. Yeah, you know, her like, name's, her name's Shantae Shantae Samantha. Megan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shucks. Um, isn't that right, George? <laughs> 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 her name was, I think her name is Shantae. I think I'm just going to annoy me now. She has, she has 1.8 million followers on TikTok. You, she goes on live and you just see all the gifts being sent to her. Send, 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 send. She goes, oh, thank you so much for the ration flower, so-and-so. Thank you for this. And these like kids, these younger people spending are, money. Are, are spending money on these people and, they, and they're making money from just doing a live. Now to me, for monetization, from that aspect, I've never, ever seen that before. It's one thing brands are going to be able to do. And the, to be honest with you, the only reason why I started making TikTok was because I saw that. <laughs> yeah, you're like, <laughs> I can reason. make money? I can make money off this? So there is a point to it. So, the, so I think that for me was the crazy thing. So that, and that is very, there's not a lot of information on it. Mm. I found very minimal blogs. And, and from a Facebook, you know, you get the content creators on Facebook as well. They get paid for content that they make. And, and but it's I've, not directly from the consumer is, on the platform. This is what I'm saying. Crazy. That's one. And two, the, the compensation is horrible compared yeah. to YouTube and Twitch and uh, other platforms. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm sure Facebook can afford it to, obviously. I don't know what they what their thinking was, but I do know that it's a pain point for people to create content on Facebook to monetize it because the compensation is just not worth it. Yeah. And you need to make it worth it for the people who's going to create the content because the people who create the content is the people who draw more attention. Exactly. Exactly. Let's make a quick TikTok. What's the best joke you know? The best joke I know? Yeah. I'm not a funny guy. <laughs> well, <laughs> what's that joke you told me the other day that was very, very good? Sorry if this is going a bit off topic. So. What joke? <laughs> you told me such a good joke the other day. What? Um, something about why did the old man fall down the wall or something like that. Me? Yeah. Was it not you? No, I didn't tell jokes. What's eh? your best joke? <laughs> okay. No, I don't know. We'll we think of something. Because I want us to do a TikTok now while we're doing it. So we can maybe show the audience and the listeners. If they can just make four or five TikToks a day, it will be, they'll, uh, be, they'll be surprised at how much reach and followers they'll have. And uh, yeah, I mean, when you have to think about a joke, I'm not... Like from my side, I like comedy but i'm not a funny person like as, uh, my face looks funny but that's about <laughs> it but so um, you got a topic there but no yeah. that's great man thank you i think from our side it was so lovely having you here like it was really enlightening and i think the tiktok um conversation was also very interesting and i hope it added a lot of value to to all the business owners and also just maybe people who are looking to get active on the platform you know it's it's good to understand the the mechanics behind it and, and what's working and what's not working so from our side i we're gonna sign off um, Carl, I want to thank you for coming through, man. It was a really insightful session. It's um, a pleasure to be here. And uh, for those of you that don't know, like once every two or three months, Carl and I hook up and I destroy him at FIFA. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Like, that's the first time he's ever lied to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first time he told a joke. <laughs> yeah, that's a joke. There we go. <laughs> so from, from my side, I think it was a real pleasure having you here. It's always a pleasure chatting to you. Like it's very, you know, there's always a great value exchange. So Appreciate from it. my side, good luck with you guys and your venture, Future Famous, and uh, yeah, keep up the good work. And I'm sure we're going to see more of each other this year, but all the best and thanks for coming. I appreciate it and thank you for having me. It's all a the pleasure best. to meet all of you. Cool, man. And everybody out there, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you guys have a great weekend. This is a Friday, but it doesn't matter what day you're listening to this. May you have a great morning, afternoon, evening, and everything else. And don't forget to do your lookalike audiences, business owners. Let us know how it goes. Go Please let it. us know how it goes. Cheers. All the best, guys. Cheers, See guys. you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.